comfort, peace and relaxation. This is Florida, with its sandy beaches and fresh air, bordered by the warm waters of the Atlantic. Peace and quiet like in a postcard. But that's not always the case. In the middle of the pandemic, these people took up the habit of meeting every week along the beaches of North Miami. But while everyone in the country wore masks, in Florida, it was always a matter of personal choice. They didn't want to wear them at all, especially not in shops and public buildings. So to take off your mask and show your smile. We may be one of the more open states, it's still not good enough. We're still being tracked, we're still being censored and suppressed. Smile, and, you know, naked smiles, naked faces are great. Underneath all the smiles hides a discourse free of restraints. They do not hesitate to insult the President Joe Biden. The inhabitants of Miami want to continue living their way. Yeah, so good to see you. Hey, 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 I love it, bro. I love it. So good to see you. So good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. I just want you to look at this right here. Look at this right here, because this shows that the people are over this. We are over it. Here's the man who brought them together this morning. Chris Nelson, 40 years old, is the founder of the group Free Florida. No more masks! No more masks! No more masks! No mask. These people, they took it upon themselves to tell you that you must wear a facial covering every time you go to the store. People in America, they have the full right to be as crazy as they want to be. You, and not from government. Thank you. Thank you, God. We are holding the, the torch for freedom in this country right now. And right now, the whole world is looking at Florida. The whole world is looking at Florida. And they see, look, people are everywhere on the beach. They said this was going to kill us. They said this was going to kill us. We've been gathering without masks. It is not killing anybody. Okay? What they told us was a bald-faced lie. And Florida's proving it right now. And if we let, bend over for these people, and if we lay down for these people, and we lose freedom in Florida, then we can ki kiss freedom in the world goodbye. We can. Chris Nelson has managed to unite a community of protesters and libertarians. People like him, who refuse to follow the rules. And in Miami, there are many of them. Located on the tip of Florida, Miami is one of the most popular cities in America. I love Miami. This is the best place. The partying, the sun, the beach. Love it. It's also, and above all, a free city with a modern way of life, totally independent of the system. For many, it's also the most rebellious city in America. And a government! Florida has always been a subversive state in the United States. Here we can meet famous retirees like Robert Platzhorn. It's very nice. <laughs> one of the biggest drug traffickers of the 1970s. Former drug traffickers and former presidents. Donald Trump has settled in Ma-a-Lago in a luxurious property. We head there for a gala dinner. Karin Turk, a former Miss Florida, will introduce us to the ex-president. This should be a part of every woman's wardrobe. On the television, she and her friends talk about resistance without a filter. The resistance is going to be important. Yeah. Everybody's here. Everybody's here in Palm Beach, and it's becoming a hub of Republican politics. Miami is America's party town. Here, people break the rules. They continue to party despite the pandemic. For firemen, every night is a struggle. Today, the city attracts Americans from all over the country. Young people, families, investors, who discover new ways of doing business. I like to mix everyone together, but it's a lot of, some people say, the masters of the universe. Only in Miami. Discover the most rebellious city in America. 
after joining the resistance and choosing Florida as her land to reclaim, 48-year-old Karen Turk is on a mission. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be good. I, you know, any day that I get to do political things and take my show is a good day. She stands against President Joe Biden, against the Democrats, against anything that isn't Republican. Hey, how are you? Good, I'm good. Every week she makes her position very clear on a television show that she hosts in a local okay. station. She's been a Donald Trump supporter yeah. since the beginning. Can we just change my background? Bianca? Yes. Let's try that. Now, because now the Capitol building's coming out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if it's flattering or not. For an hour, she comments on the news and gives her strong and virulent opinions on all the trending subjects. He's China Biden. I mean, he loves China. So we should be being really tough on China. And, you know, Joe's not going to do anything. Joe's on their side. This is not what the people that voted for them expected. They expected that this president was going to stand up and represent them and by sweeping this stuff under the rug and trying to, you know, make it go away, he's just making himself look bad. You know, children are going to, you know, be allowed to change their gender. I mean, it's just wild. It's just crazy that this is even a conversation and that this is something that a legislature would stand behind. It's just it's nuts. I mean, you know what I think? I think the next generation, we're going to need a lot of therapists. More than 200,000 people follow her activities on TV and social media. It's very easy to be outspoken here. I mean, we are a red state, and it is nice to be somewhere where there are a lot of like-minded people. I think that Florida is going to be the leader as far as politics going forward. Everybody's here. Everybody's here in Palm Beach, and it's becoming a hub of Republican politics. You know, and the, and the former president's here, and, and that's huge. But I think this is really quickly becoming a base for politics for our entire country. And I'm really happy to be here, because obviously that puts me in the center of the universe of something that I love. Now, hey, how are you? Good. I love this color on you, this yellow. Today she welcomes her colleague, who has left California to settle in Miami, to explain why she made this choice. My whole thing started out just like, let's expose these terrible policies in California and hope and pray that they don't spread to the rest of the country. But that's, you know, we're seeing that happen. We are. Especially with how many people are leaving blue states last year because of just these terrible lockdowns and horrible Democrat policies. I'm really glad you're our neighbor now. Really glad to have you. I know you're going to be getting involved in political issues here, and we're very happy to have you in Florida. So welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. New life. <laughs> awesome. I think the resistance is going to be in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm here. I came to Florida because I really do see this as being sort of the future of the country, I guess, if that makes sense. And I believe that the people of Florida, as well as the leadership here, are actually standing up for, you know, American rights and constitutional values. So moving forward, I think that this is kind of the place to be. Behind the scenes is Karen's 18-year-old daughter, who helps out with filming and closely follows her mother's career. That's my favorite color. Oh, thank you. We're also trying to get her interested in politics, so. We'll okay. see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> She's trying to brainwash me. Maybe a little. I just want, you know, I want you to apply logic. I want you to be smart. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, that. I've tried to, you know, raise your right. Yeah. Raise your right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let's bring on Mrs. Wellington, Karen Turk. Before, Karen's life was all glitter, glamour, and beauty pageants. herself as energetic, optimistic, and driven. In 2016, she won the title of Mrs. Florida, a contest for women over 40 years old. She became famous and used her newfound status to launch herself into politics. I do, I have the sash too. I miss the days that I, I wore this back in 2016. I do. I feel like this should be a part of every woman's wardrobe. I came here 21 years ago from New Jersey. I did live in New Jersey most of my life. 
Um, I came here and I came here to be free, just like so many people are now leaving other places to come here and are learning what I learned 21 years ago. You know, I was kind of escaping from a bad marriage and a situation where I was unhappy, and Florida was that escape. In her living room is a portrait of a hero who thanked her for her support and engagement. Tonight, she's hosting a reception for a delegation of elected Republicans from New York. Karen is a very active lobbyist, a woman who chooses her friends carefully and strategically networks. Hi, hi, I'm Karen. She remains in the good books of the Trumpists of Florida, those who are determined to disrupt, as they say, the smooth running of the system. I am so incredibly blessed to be in this room of amazing patriots. I'm so glad that we were able to put this together, and it's such a testament to why people are coming to Florida. I'm so glad to have everybody here. Welcome to the neighborhood. I heard somebody say one time, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. So when you look at four years, it's a moment in time. And you know, as a party, as a Republican party, and as conservatives, we have to unite right now in this moment. Florida's elected official, a war veteran, came to the event. In a few days, we'll accompany Karen to a gala evening a few kilometers away in Mar-a-Lago, the spectacular residence of the former president. Karen has access to this very exclusive club where membership fees are $200,000 per year. Tonight, Donald Trump will be present. There's another famous retiree a few blocks away, a more modest one who prefers to remain discreet, Robert Plathorn. It's, been a long it's hard day. to imagine that this man who resembles a retired grandfather is in reality one of the most famous drug dealers in Miami. I'm not waiting for anybody. Where's Josh? Yes, it is. The this great fishing enthusiast was the leader of one of the most powerful gangs in Florida in the 1970s, the Black Tuna. His signature move was to outrun the Coast Guard with his drug-laden boats. This is almost good weather for smuggling. A little more fog. This is where there's no visibility. Then you zoom, you run in on the radar find the opening on the radar and <coughs> Black Tuna. That was the name used to refer to the drug shipments. Imagine I'm going out to meet a Colombian ship <coughs> on the other side of the Bahamas. Captain Randy was our captain. We would go out and we would catch sailfish and marlin and big fish and then check in at the Bahamas and leave in the middle of the night to meet the Colombian ship and we'd load up 20 or 30,000 pounds of really excellent cannabis. Excellent cannabis. Excellent. I love Santa excellent Marta cannabis. Gold, man. <laughs> You're a good man. He still smokes marijuana even though it's illegal in Florida. This is very nice. <laughs> he has stopped trafficking. Now, he only transports tuna. That's a wahoo. Wahoo! At the time, he was nicknamed the Pope of Ganja. He and his men would import nearly 500 tons of marijuana to the United States, mainly on small fishing boats like this one. Here he is on the right in a photo from the 1970s. The FBI sentenced him to 60 years in prison. He served only half of it. You don't know me. Come here, man. Tell me. At the dock today, he meets some old gang members, even some cellmates. Randy. Yeah. Which Randy? Lanier? Yeah. 
Oh my God, gay. I got it right now. Thank you, Dora. Dora, just go. I need you. You didn't, you didn't look like that when you were my Sally. I'm just kidding. I'm just I'm just How you doing, buddy? We yeah. were Sally's. I kept telling my, my son's over here somewhere. I want to be hey. he, was, he was my roommate in prison. Hey. Yeah. For a while. I had a lot of roommates. 1987. Hello. You're Robert. I'm Robert. Billy Dick. Hey, Billy. How you meet you? Hey. In red is his friend Billy. He I used to transport drugs by air. Trying to get you out. He's not my nephew. I'm a pilot, and I took the opportunity to make for the highest paying job pilots can have, I guess. I didn't, and I flew down to Colombia and Jamaica and Nicaragua and uh, Belize. And How long did you do, Billy? 25 years and seven months. Smile. I want to get everybody moving toward that big boat. With his movie star looks and the life stories that go with it, Robert's story is part of Florida's history. Proof of the possibilities and vices of living in Florida. Drugs came to Miami in the 70s. Marijuana, cocaine. The city was the scene of a gang war unlike any other in the United States. It became the gateway to all trafficking. Drugs helped fund the development of the city, the economy and real estate. The money was laundered in nightclubs. Miami became synonymous with scandals. This era inspired the most famous gangster figure of all, Tony Montana in the movie Scarface, and the most famous police duo. Today, Robert lives peacefully in Palm Beach, but he's not abandoned his business entirely. At 77, he started a medical cannabis business for seniors and retirees in Florida. I'm sure I must have a copy of that whole, almost that whole magazine feature was about me. And it had some great old pictures. That's me in London so whole when I lived in Europe. Were you thinking about smuggling at that time? No, I was educating. So how did you end up being the smuggler? Like most people, by accident. Most of the smuggling uh, was Americans and Cubans from Miami. The Cubans had a lot of fishing boats and uh, they used to smuggle in great big loads. I saw a load of 150,000 pounds off one boat. That was a lot. It wasn't the best marijuana, but it was a lot of marijuana. I brought in only the best marijuana. American traffickers and Cuban fishermen became allies in the waters of Florida. Drugs continued to wreak havoc in the city's neighborhoods. A few miles from South Beach is Liberty City, a different setting with a different atmosphere. This neighborhood is run by its gangs, its biker gangs. Every Sunday, Kelvin and his friends from the South Florida Riders take to the streets and break all the rules. Stunts, speed and adrenaline. They even have their fans who come to watch their illegal races. Like out of town, it's like some some pumps out of town. You can just pull up and, and, and get gas without paying. But you got when you pump your gas, then you go in and pay. That, but that's out of town. They can't have that now. <laughs> they gonna pull up and pay and go know what they did. There's not a lot of hard enforcement, in my opinion. Everyone needs to follow the laws, including myself, including them. So if they are breaking the laws, you know the police should be enforcing laws. That should be happening. Over here is more lenient. The cops, you know, they got more other stuff to worry about. The cops don't care. I mean, they care. Don't get it twisted. They do, but we do it on a daily basis. It's like, come on, they can't, they can't control it. It's uncontrollable. Several young people have died while being chased by the police. When they're on the road, they take all the risks. 
Their neighborhood, Liberty City, is known as one of the most dangerous in Miami, riddled with drug trafficking and gang violence. Kelvin grew up here. His house has become the biker's headquarters. What, that's that old shit? Huh? Nah, that just happened last night. He... <laughs> Miami Beach is for the tourists and all that though, like all the rich people and stuff like that. Over here, it's probably you gotta get it how you live over here. So what do people do here? Everything. Everything. They all earn their living one day at a time. And in the evenings, they drive as a way to escape. Uh, accident sometimes in your world. All the time. I was in a coma. First time, when, when I was at my second week in Miami, I went to a coma. Fell off. Yeah, that, was, that was the second week. That was my second week. Yeah, we were going right back down to yeah, Kendall. Oh, yeah. I, think I, I think I had got you hiked. Just put over the handle. Only in Florida. The best place right here, the best city okay. to ride in. Okay. The best city for everything. Partying, hanging out. Best city you can do whatever you that's fucking that's want. Yeah. That's right there. Almost. Right there. Right Almost. Right right there. Right there. Almost. Kelvin's father set up a small barbecue business in the backyard. He caters for the whole neighborhood. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison for armed robbery. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, we had uh, hot dogs, sausage, everything. Oh, everything. Okay. Anytime we're gonna do hamburgers. You know? hamburgers. Okay, let me know here. Do it, do it right one year. Okay. He, he got the secret. I don't know. The, I don't know his secret. <laughs> How to success in Miami? You can't sell dope and all that shit all your life. You be doing something different, helping the people out. So this is what we're doing now, barbecuing, Ro rolling motorcycle, that's what we're doing. Yeah, huh? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Oh, I don't know. Probably, I don't know what's going on, but they ain't come here, so we good. At the end of the day, everyone leaves. On the way, they're joined by other biker gangs. They take over the roads and are by no means worried by the police. A demonstration of power. They parade along the beaches like a group of bandits. They mingle with the party goers of Miami Beach, the tourist district that never stops moving to the rhythm of parties and shows. While the whole world was in lockdown, here rules and restrictions were much more lenient. Neither the bars nor the beaches have ever closed. Living life, you know. <laughs> they enjoyed parties as if nothing had happened. To bypass the curfew, illegal parties were organized at night. They were held away from the city center, like this one. All guests were invited at the last minute. Going on, unless you're, you know, you're connected in, in, the, in the background. It's kind of like, uh, like for instance, we have since uh, COVID, we started these like WhatsApp chats, and it's we went from like social media promotion to like unless you're on that chat, you're not even gonna know what's going on. Almost got off um, on another block, and then there was like some kind of private party, and it seemed a bit not like the party that we are trying to go to, and then yeah, but then we found out. Inside is a nightclub like any other. In fact, it's a hangar specially prepared for the occasion. On the decks is a young 30-year-old Belgian, DJ Georgia, a new star of Miami's nightlife who was totally unknown a few weeks ago. Many leading DJs were confined in their countries. This was her chance. These illegal parties became a trend. Avec la pandémie, on a eu l'opportunité d'apporter un peu un, 
un côté européen euh, à la nightlife euh, de Miami et euh, offrir des soirées euh, underground, différentes, dans des, dans des lieux, euh, dans des lieux euh, où on n'a pas l'habitude d'avoir de, de, des soirées. Miami continued to dance despite restrictions. A few blocks away, we joined the bikers of Liberty City. Motorbikes are replaced by cars. Powerful engines, big cylinders and guns. They take over parking lots and transform empty streets into racetracks. Kelvin will be our guide this evening. Oh, back it up, Santa. You back it up, just back it up in. So you, so when you, so when you leave, you just jump in and go. You won't have to back out and to jump in your car. Go. <laughs> so back it in. Why do you have to leave fast? Huh? Because the police come, you want, you want to get, you want to get blocked in. A game of cat and mouse. The lookouts have signaled that the police are coming. Yeah, you go straight in there, make a right, make, make a right at this corner. It's time to leave as fast as possible. More crazy, guys. Because the police go to come, and when they come, they, they, they go to try to catch a the people. They bring the helicopter out and all. <laughs> like one time we went, they brought the helicopter and then everything out. Two helicopters. One was low, one was like real low, and one was like high. Tonight, things are about to get ugly. We told you about this story yesterday. One person killed six others injured in a deadly hit and run crash. We're now seeing surveillance video of the fatal wreck. Surveillance video captures the fatal wreck near 119th Street and 22nd Avenue in Northwest Miami Dade. One of the drivers crashed into a family car and fled the scene. We arrived on the scene a few minutes after the accident. This thing look crazy. It doesn't do anything to you? No. Small boy. Man, that shit. Smash these people's car and I left. How they not hurt? All the airbags out in the car and the whole front gone, so how he not hurt? It could always be dangerous, so you always gotta, like, stuff like this. Just like this, we just how we just having fun, just chilling. Everybody leave, then something happened like this. And that just killed everybody's spirit for a little bit, and then they'll be back. They'll talk about it, what happened to this and that. And then they'll be back just doing the same thing the next day. Miami Dade detectives on the hunt. One dead and six injured. Accidents like this occur in Miami more than 20,000 times a year. Florida is one of the most dangerous states in terms of road accidents one of the deadliest in the United States. A call for witnesses with a $5,000 reward has been issued to find the perpetrator. After several weeks, he's still on the run. He faces up to 30 years in prison. At night, the city's firefighters have to deal with an overwhelming number of calls. Someone has just reported a man drowning. It is about driving a fire truck on Miami Beach. New rule. Like driving in the wrong direction of travel on a freeway during rush hour. Come on, Mike, come on, Mike. Oh, man! Get the fuck out of the way! Go, go, don't move, don't move. It's working, it's working. Stay in the center. In front of the vehicle, cars are driving at over 90 kilometers per hour. Yes, yes, go, go, go. You got it, yes. Good, go, 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 go. In less than 10 minutes, they arrive at the scene. Oh, it's a drowning. It's a drowning? Yeah. At night? Yeah, at night. In the freezing water. How do we get How is that possible? They know his chances of survival are getting smaller with every passing minute. There's a guy out there drowning. So he went out there on a surfboard to put him on top of the surfboard to bring him back. Yeah, on the beach here. 
perhaps is a lot of people go out drinking, they have a hard time getting swimming back, either with the current keeping them out, or a riptide, or just an inexperienced swimmer. As soon as the man is brought back to the beach, he's handcuffed and the police take him away. He's under the influence of narcotics and is hallucinating. Sometimes people are reacting to to drugs that they're taking that they aren't made in a pharmacy, you know? <laughs> who knows what he took and who knows how he took it, but we better help him and it's all nice. It's the beginning of a long night. Miami is one of the most lively cities in the United States. All year long, tourists and students from all over the country come here. The fire department rarely responds to fires. Alongside the police, they must manage one of the most unpredictable cities in the United States. At five o'clock in the morning, one more call. A drunk man was hit by a car. The driver fled. The victim is between life and death. After they determine that whatever the problem was, then they'll release the scene and open up the road. The victim doesn't make it before arriving at the hospital. Station number one is one of the oldest fire stations in the city. The pace here is fast. With just 40 firemen, there are no less than 20 emergencies every day. In charge of them is Brendan. As soon as that bell goes off, we gotta go. So we'll see. If a white light goes on, that's the ladder. Red is the fire engine. Blue is the is one of the rescue units, and green is the other rescue unit. So once we'll hear the, the bell go off, we'll see the light. So we know whose turn it is. And if they all go off, that means there's something big going on. It's been 25 years that Brendan's been in charge of the fire station. Over the years, it's become a station of pranksters, especially when it's exceptionally quiet like today. We had that spigot installed for this reason. They have a sense of duty, but also a sense of humor. This is a special treatment for all newcomers after their first job. It's a tradition we have here at the One House. The best ones are even posted on social media. I ain't scared of nothing. I ain't scared of nothing. Brendan and his men have made this their trademark. Every job is an opportunity to be seen. We met them a few months ago at Halloween when they took their shot at DJing. Miami firefighters are now known as much for their bravery as for their sense of humor. We want to make the people happy. And we make, look at all the people smiling out there. That's what we do. Engine one, one house, B, ship. Make the people happy. We're here for the people. It's just a typical, typical day on the job, right? Typical day. Typical day. Miami has a population of 90,000 across just four square kilometers. With party goers, the population can quadruple in the high season. This brings about a lot of funny situations. Thanks, Phil. 
Today, Brendan's team was called to rescue this man on the ground. The police are also on the scene. His wheelchair was stolen. Now, there's someone stole it and went running away with it. With the wheelchair? With the wheelchair. They said someone in a referee looking shirt ran laughing with the wheelchair. That's why I sent the uh, gator to go take a look and see if they could find him. Look, yeah, he's walking fine. Look at him walking away. The man was using a wheelchair to beg for money from tourists. Miracle. You see that? It must be that light rain. It's uh, less rain. He just got up and started running away. Only in Miami. Unconventional and original. Today, Miami is the most Cuban-influenced city in the United States. Nearly two million exiles found refuge in the United States after the victorious revolution of Fidel Castro. They have their own district, Little Havana. Here, we explored the traces of their culture and met one of their role models, Susie Taylor. This 50-year-old, who never goes unnoticed, is a big figure in the Latino community. How are you? Hi, thank you. And you? She's an influencer who campaigns for the liberation of Cuba. Three hundred and sixty-seven kilometers separate Miami from Havana. Thousands of Cubans made the journey, risking their lives on makeshift boats. They were called balseros. As soon as they set foot on Florida soil, they were granted a permanent residence permit. Miami welcomed them with open arms. This is what Ernesto, Susie's husband, experienced. He also fled the island of Cuba 40 years ago. Y estar en mis playas libremente, poder caminar por una calle como lo hago aquí libremente, que si quiero bailar bailo, si quiero decir viva Cuba libre, la gente va a aplaudir. Esa es la Habana, esa es la Cuba que yo quiero. Betty Pino, ella murió, era, era. aquí está Marta Flores, que son personalidades muy conocidas. Es un Hollywood de Cuba. Give me five. ¡Epa! Esta parte de la ciudad fue fundada por los primeros cubanos que emigraron en el año 1959 y antes. Pero la gran emigración fue después que Fidel Castro tomó el poder y tuvimos cuatro millones de cubanos que emigraron a Miami. Entraron por aquí todos, se distribuyeron al resto de los Estados Unidos, pero muchos se quedaron aquí. Today we commemorate a significant event in the history between the two countries. The failed landing in the Bay of Pigs 60 years ago. An attempted military invasion of Cuba, supported by the CIA. Susie has come to cover the event for her blog. She meets Cuban veterans who participated in the operation. Aquí en la Florida hay libertad de empresa y libertad personal y respeto a los derechos humanos. En Cuba... Cero! No hay ni comida. Nada. Por eso está culito, bello y hermoso. Gracias, mi amor. The governor of the state of Florida came to pay tribute to these veterans. He supports the Cuban community. He thinks that their vote could change elections. So I can tell you this, 
as long as I am the governor of this state, the state of Florida will be led by the spirit of the brigade. Thank you. His anti-communist stance has made him the favorite of Susie and many other Cubans. Ese va a ser nuestro presidente. Es un hombre, es un hombre, es un hombre, es un hombre de valor. Es un hombre de valor por la ley y el orden. Él no se vende. Él tiene valores, principio, moral y defiende a los floridianos. Por eso lo queremos. We the people lo vamos a apoyar. Todo el pueblo lo quiere. Vamos a una foto, please. Nuestra gente lo quiere, gracias, gracias por todo lo que hace por los floridianos. Una foto. Nuestro presidente, nuestro presidente, presidente, presidente. Secret Service is going to give us credentials. They're going to sweep the man, and then we're going to go from there over to Mar a Lago. All right, that was my limo guy. So the limo is set for tonight. It's Karen's big night. She's invited to Donald Trump's residence for a gala event. Mommy's lucky she's going. Right? I'm going to have a really fabulous night with great patriotic people. And it's going to be really the last event of the season at Mar-a-Lago. So. The event is in Palm Beach in North Miami, where the most billionaires of the country live. This is where the former president spends six months of the year, in his super luxurious mansion, Mar a Lago. Originally, it was the winter residence of a rich heiress of a great dynasty of cornflake makers, Marjorie Post. At the beginning of the last century, she was the richest woman in America. Everything is in abundance. 58 rooms, 33 bathrooms, 12 fireplaces, everything in marble and gold leaf. Donald Trump fell in love. He bought it for $8 million and renovated it to his liking. Even more gold and glamour. He made it his private mansion as well as a very exclusive club. Karen is one of the 400 selected guests of the evening. No. One more. The Secret Service has a really tight hold on who can go in, and when you go into the ballroom, you actually have to lock your phone, so um, you're not going to be able to see inside, but I'm going to go inside now, and I'm glad at least I could show you a little bit of a slice of heaven here in Palm Beach. We managed to see a little more of the property. <laughs> Donald Trump makes his appearance. The country may have elected a new Democratic president, but Florida has remained Republican. Right. Donald Trump knows that he's surrounded by his unyielding supporters here. Karen is one of them. At the end of the evening, he greets the staff members one by one. Donald Trump is in his element among his followers. The spirit of freedom that Florida embodies is what attracts today's young investors. It's 7 a.m. About a hundred cyclists gathered at the foot of the buildings that border the marina. They are bicycle enthusiasts, but above all, entrepreneurs. All of them work in finance and new technologies. They chose Miami for the business benefits. Damien Balamio created a network to facilitate the integration of startup managers who settled in Florida. What are you doing right now? We're adding people to the WhatsApp group that we have for writers. What is that group? All the people that we write, uh, we write uh, every weekend. Uh, the tech writers, so you know, we're organized through the group, so you know, we're adding more people that just showed up. I guess everybody knows the key loop that's here, or how many people from out of town? They left San Francisco, New York, and Chicago to come here. All of them proudly wear clothes with the same words How can I help? A tweet published a few months ago by the mayor of Miami to attract investors. A small phrase with a big impact. In a few months, 
Miami has become the trendy destination for startups. Biking is a great place to socialize. Yeah. You talk about contract, you talk about like a... Yeah, you raise money, you uh, make friends, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of different things. Among the newcomers this morning is Greg Gallant, a 38-year-old from New York who just moved to Miami a few weeks ago. All right, yeah, I got, had my second uh, vaccine shot two days ago, so I'm still in a bit of recovery mode. How are they saying you do well, my friend? Giving yeah. you vaccines, giving you apartments, giving you good weather, what else can you need? It's true, yeah. yeah. <laughs> huh? it's feeling great. It's a beautiful morning, perfect weather, so what, what better way to start the day? See you on the road. A wealthy group that has a big impact. Like Greg, there are hundreds of people who have chosen Miami to develop their businesses and the trend is growing. The mayor of Miami has decided to make his city a capital of new technology, even more attractive than Silicon Valley in California. And he has good arguments to present. A heavenly setting, but above all, an advantageous tax system for companies with some of the lowest taxes in the country. It was great. Yeah, fun ride. Why do you appreciate all this, the, uh, the views of the water, palm trees, great weather, wide shoulders, just like the French Riviera. But at the moment, you just have so many people from all over the world here in Miami, which makes it really exciting. It's very diverse, uh, and there's great energy to it. <laughs> Six months ago, Greg would never have thought of leaving everything to come here. It was love at first sight. I got to Miami for uh, a two week to spend two weeks here and uh, work remotely and ended up being the longest two weeks of my life. I, I got here January 5th and I'm still here now in the vapor. He bought an apartment on Miami Beach and plans to move in this autumn. For the moment, he lives in the high rise buildings overlooking the bay. A big apartment, 12,000 euros per square meter. It's three times cheaper than rent in Manhattan. He used to live in a small two-room apartment. Now he even has room for his bike. But his biggest gem is in this closet. So this is a laundry machine. I've never lived in an apartment with one of these machines before. And in New York, we always felt this is, uh, this is a sign that you've made it, having your own laundry machine. Uh, in Miami, it's pretty standard. I have a lot of fun doing the laundry because I never uh, it was a novelty to me as a New Yorker. You'd always have to go and drag it out to the laundromat. So I'm still in the mode where it's fun to do laundry. And how's it going with scheduling all the, uh, the candidate interviews? How many do I have coming up? I think you have two coming up and I think one tomorrow and actually one later. Greg works in corporate communications. He employs over 100 people. He was the first to set up a base in Florida and is now the envy of his employees like his assistant, who calls him from New York. Are you, are you jealous of Greg for being in Florida? Yes, I keep offering to come down and help him in person, but so far I'm still here. <laughs> I think Miami is uh, definitely a paradise for startups. I mean, it's a great, great paradise uh, in general already with palm trees and the weather. And then if you can come here and do a startup, especially if you're just getting started. A lot of uh, doing a startup is being really frugal and bootstrapping at the beginning. And it's a lot easier to bootstrap in a less expensive city like Miami than it is in a city like San Francisco. At the end of the day, Greg and his girlfriend head out. They're going to a very important party to build their network. A party that celebrates the end of the very first tech week organized in Miami. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know very much about it. Yeah, Davey is telling me I should go. Uh, but I believe it's, uh, it's a house uh, right on the water with a nice uh, view of the sunset. Good evening. Uh, Gregory Gallant. Thank you. The evening takes place in South Beach in a gated community. A private, highly protected community. Residences here are among the most expensive in Miami. Yeah, it, I can't. I can't shake my uh, detail here. How you been? Greg meets his biker friends. 
Tonight, they meet new figures of the Miami tech world. The CEO of Twitter is expected any minute. The host is Juan Pablo Capello, a renowned investor in the Latino community. I like to mix everyone together, but it's a lot of, some people say the masters of the universe. There's a lot of um, people very well known in tech, but then there's also entrepreneurs who are just getting started, diverse entrepreneurs, female fund managers. We really just try to, what makes Miami special is there's so much diversity. Miami always reinvents itself, sort of every 10 years. Um, you know, Miami started, it was a city of, uh, of alcohol, and alcohol is prohibited. Obviously in the 1980s, Miami got a certain reputation. In the 1990s, 2000s, Miami was all about um, big hotels, real estate investments, real estate projects, and I think what we're going to see in the next 10 years is Miami is known for its tech community. That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. That's what we're trying to do. So thank you very no, much. No, no problem. So if you guys could put that away, that'd sure. be great. Thank you. A city that has reinvented itself. The rebellious Miami is becoming trendy. Three years ago, it became the leading city for startup activity in the whole country, far ahead of Los Angeles, San Diego, and New York.